time is exactly one so with uh, now we are going to proceed to our lecture so good afternoon to all participant resource person and our honorable vice chancellor in today webinar we are going to held today now so first of all i welcome all of you in this webinar and uh, madam especially uh, we are very much thankful to you because of, you have a lot of engagement as you mentioned in your first mail even then you agree to give this uh, lecture webinar so thank you so much and uh, before going to you know start our function i just request our honorable vice chancellor to speak few words then i will uh, good afternoon madam uh, good afternoon sir uh, so very nice of you and uh, kindly accepted our invitation and uh, uh, giving a very valuable lecture particularly relevant to this pandemic situation uh, teaching uh, from remote uh, area and uh, how because uh, online is getting a lot of importance and uh, people are really uh, have so many doubts about online instruction how to be implemented online examinations to be implemented so this is one of the very important topic of the present situation so i am also very eager to listen to you thank you very much and uh, i will be there and i will be listening madam thank you welcome madam thank you sir so uh, madam uh, now i am uh, going to give a brief introduction about today resource person because participant they are across the country and uh, uh, they are may they interested to know about our today resource person so uh, dr kiran ko uh, he is an associate professor at university in at the department of library and information science faculty of computer science and information technology university of malaya she is also currently the director of quality management and enhancement center responsibility for accreditation and quality insurance cell of uh, of all the level of the academic program in university of malaya dr kiran research interest include information services service quality quality management academic librarianship social networking community information services social capital and center metrics her research community her research publications appears in the numerous web of science index journal she is the co editor of the malaysian journal of library and information science which is indexed in both social science social science citation index and scopus she has served as a as a president of the Malaysian chapter of International Library and Information Science Society and as an active member of the consortium of ICE scholars in Asian Pacific Dr Kiran has served on the technical committee of the various conferences and as a member of the editorial board of the several website journal with this brief introduction madam i welcome you in mizoram university and uh, now session is handed over to you please share your screen and start presentation all right thank you very much uh, let me start by first saying a very good afternoon to all of you you know thank you for the uh, vice chancellor your know, prof uh, sambasiva for being here today and also dr manoj thank you for the invitation and um, Okay, uh, from the brief introduction just now, um, I will continue. Let me share my screen. Do let me know if it is visible to everyone. Yeah, it is visible, madam. Now. Yes. All right. Okay. So um, when Dr. Manoj invited me for this talk. I had initially declined. Sorry for that. Yeah, because the university is currently um, preparing for the following semester, which is also going to be in remote form. Yeah. So in a way, at our university, we are still con we consider ourselves uh, still being in a state of an emergency. Yeah, because people are still unsure of what is happening day to day. So um, when I thought about what should I talk about. yeah because i know the this is being organized by the department of library and information science and i come from the same similar department but uh, my other portfolio as the quality management and enhancement center director has also got me very much involved in uh, how university malaya tackled the uh, pandemic and what was happening to education at that time when we had a shutdown so i said okay uh, i 
chose the title Jumpstart, Remote Teaching and Learning During an Emergency. Yeah? So there are two terms that are being used, uh, Jumpstart and Emergency. Yeah? Why Jumpstart and why Emergency? Okay, basically I will just go through, I will begin a little bit about the situation itself. Yeah? Because we are right now in a destructive situation. All right, and um, I just pulled up this data this morning. All right, uh, just Googled the situation. And these numbers are very sad. Yeah. So whatever we are moving towards now, we have to keep this in mind. Because what was happening since early this year, and most of us thought, okay, this might be short term. All right, probably we are doing online for this particular time, but it seems to be growing. Yeah. This pandemic is growing. It is uh, giving us very sad numbers day to day. All right. And uh, I pulled out for India and Malaysia yeah, based on population. Uh, numbers based on population might be small, might be big, but I think every number there is a person. Every case is a person. Yeah. So every case that we see, whether it is in thousands or millions, it is still it could be one of our students, it could be one of our staff. Yeah, so the impact is directly uh, on us. Yeah? We feel this impact. And, and I looked at literature. A lot of literature, when they talk about education, they talk about teaching learning in this era now, in this pandemic, they use the word emergency also. Yeah? And that word actually um, related a little bit to me because let me just share what happened yeah i first hand uh, went through a little bit of an emergency if you look on the right hand side i have put up a movement control which happened in malaysia and you see that in malaysia the first phase where we had a total lockdown started on 18th of march and um, i was actually in india in new delhi at that time Yes, I had gone to New Delhi uh, and uh, like everyone else, since it was in January, February, March, plans were being made and we were like, okay, this is happening in China and you feel that you're not really affected by this. Yeah, and I made plans for travel until I was supposed to be back on the 16th and flights will be cancelled. Yeah, my flight got cancelled. I had my child with me and it was a panic state. So to me at that time, it was a state of emergency because it is something which happens very suddenly and overnight, you might not be able to go back to your country, you might not be able to go back to your home. So when that happens, you will automatically do something which will push you to go, become a bit more vigilant and become and find a solution. So I had to rush within 24 hours, I had to rush find a solution, what can I do to get home by the 18th? Yeah. So we managed that, the embassy helped us very much, the Indian embassy in Malaysia and the Malaysian embassy in India helped us to get out. But at the same time, so we, I was home by the 19th morning, I'm back in Malaysia. But the surprising thing, one lesson that I learned from this was for those who did not take that step, yeah, because announcements were being made, flights were being cancelled, and I contacted a few of my other friends who were there. Let's go back. There is a flight. And it was a sort of a state of misbelief. No, it won't happen. People tend to, you know, we information scientists, we know about that. Yeah, when you get information, there's some level of disbelief. And those who didn't come back by the 18 were stranded for another two weeks before the government made another emergency flight there to get them back. Yeah. So my point here is, when something happened drastically, we also need drastic uh, retaliation. We need to look at the situation and we need to quickly react. Okay, so um, before I go further into that, I just want to give a brief uh, overview of University of Malaya. All right, so in Malaysia, I come from a university which is the first university in the country. All right, it was earlier we were partners with Singapore University, then we separated. And uh, we have about 13 faculties with more than 16 undergraduate students, about 10,000 postgraduate students. 
and uh, international students from 90 different countries. Yeah? So we are a comprehensive university. We have faculties in all areas, right? Sciences and non-sciences. Uh, we work very hard in research to get our university rankings, yes. In University of Malaya, you will see that uh, we have been um, pushing a lot on uh, our performances because we are happy to see that our ranking, whether in Asia or QS world ranking is improving, but it is not only based on uh, research, but we work very hard also in our teaching learning, our curriculum. Yeah, so we had actually done a initiative by the, uh, we have the vice, deputy vice chancellor of academic and internationalization who devised this uh, initiatives so that our curriculum will be a 21st century ready curriculum. We produce graduates as that. So we had a lot of things lined up for 2021. In the next two years, this is what we want to do. We were pushing towards having online um, classes, MOOC, and introducing new instructional technologies and introducing an, a very flexible curriculum. But what happened was we were just starting on that. Yeah, early this year, we were just beginning. A lot of it was it at planning stage and we were just beginning. And what, when the pandemic happened, it was like, that's it. There's no more planning. You just have to go ahead and now do it. Yeah. So uh, this is basically a background to University of Malaya and what we were trying to do earlier this year. And I come from uh, the Department of Library and Information Science. Uh, this is a very small department in U University of Malaya. We are actually in the Faculty of Computer Science and Information Technology. These are the members. There are only seven of us in the department. Uh, we do not have an undergraduate library science program. We conduct a two master's program in library science, coursework, and a research program. But we have a good a number of uh, PhD students. Yeah? Many of them are international students who come to us for their PhD. Yes. And um, one of the achievements of our department actually that we are proud of, and uh, we are also, I suppose, um, if you look at KOS ranking uh, for the subject area under library science, library information science, uh, we are at number 36 yeah, in the world ranking. And one of the, uh, our achievement actually is uh, Malaysian Journal of Library and Information Science. And this journal has been around uh, since 1997, and it is now indexed by Web of Science and uh, Scopus. And I would like to say here, actually, the beginning of this journal was uh, by one of our visiting professor, yeah, Professor B.K. Sen from India. When we first started the program, I was a student then for this program, and uh, he was my lecturer, and uh, he initiated this journal for our department and uh, he encouraged students to publish, encourages us to do research and publish and keep this journal going. And uh, we are proud to say that till now, uh, this journal has been ongoing. It is an open access journal. The URL is here. Uh, you can access, it is all uh, free of charge. There's no payment, there's no subscription. It's open to all, yeah. And if you, any one of you, those of you from the library science background, uh, if you like to know further about the department members, uh, we have an online uh, system, which we call the UM expert system. So our CV is um, available on this system. You may uh, look into that further in case anyone is interested to collaborate for research. Okay. Um, all right. Why jumpstart? Okay, the, the term came to me uh, as a title, mainly because the, the, the word jumpstart again, it reminded me of uh, a car when the battery is dead and what we need to do to get it started. All right, so people become complacent when the pandemic happened, uh, everything was being shut down. Yeah, we were in lockdown, we had to be staying home, all the classes are canceled. And there needed to be something to re-energize everyone. We needed to ignite that remote teaching learning because in University of Malaya, basically, we are very, very um, conventional. We are a conventional university. 
Yeah, we are not a university which uh, offer online courses. You will not find that on our website. We conduct certain classes online. Yes, we have been moving towards uh, blended learning. We do have an online learning management system. So we use that to upload our notes and uh, keep in touch with our students. But being an uh, open distance learning, no, that is not being practiced in UM. All right. And we had to move towards that. So I looked up, jumpstart, yes. Start or improve something, yes. So for those who were not into remote teaching, we had to make them start. Now is the time you have to start, there's no waiting, all right? And those who were already using some sort of online uh, teaching platform, we needed to improve, improve tremendously because now it is going to be fully online, all right? So just i it tells me it's just like a car you see when your car is dead you need an external battery to start it off all right so that's what we needed to do with the people within university malaya the lecturers we needed to do this to them we needed to provide them a platform or a way to start it off because the pandemic was something which is an epidemic occurring worldwide all right. So people look at it in terms of, okay, it's a disease, it's an epidemic, it's spreading. But when you are concerned with the individual, then it becomes an emergency situation, especially for universities. When it came to the university, the university is not thinking of it as, a, as an epidemic, but the university is now thinking of it as an emergency case, because where are the students? You know, everything is at standstill. There's, there's no staff in the university. There's no student in the university. So it is something which is serious because education stopped. It is something which is unexpected, all right? Uh, it was leading towards that from January, but people were like, well, it's not, it's not so serious. It's not so serious. It's just happening in China. But overnight, we were in a lockdown, all right? So there was supposed to be immediate attention, all right? So, even in the literature, when we look, I search for some literature online and I see that this word emergency is being used, especially for remote teaching learning, all right? So what is the emergency actually? What is the emergency at the university level? What is the emergency at the teaching learning level, all right? And the, another term which keep popping up now is this pandemic pedagogy, yeah? Uh, there's some literature which is introducing this. We know pedagogy. All right, we learn that so that we can become better instructors. But what is a pandemic pedagogy? All right. So this emergency, I would say, first of all, your students. Students had to go back. Yeah, I am sure in your case, it's the same. Shutting down of the universities, students get go back home. So the teaching learning immediately stops. So what is the lecturer facing now? Now the lecturer is facing empty classrooms. Okay, so in this situation, student is back home, lecturer is also back home, there's classrooms are empty. Uh, where's the connection? How are we going to connect? How do you continue with education in this kind of a situation? All right, so of course, for a few weeks, like for example, in uh, University of Malaya itself, we had a time frame for of about five weeks. Yeah. So the government announced university closed, students go back, lecturers stay home, everyone is at home. So for five weeks, there was a break. Nothing was happening. And then, of course, the solution, worldwide solution was e-learning. Right? Because the pandemic was not going away, uh, situations were not improving, so you have to go back to e-learning. Right? So how easy is that? How smooth did that go? Now, when we think of this as a solution, we have to think of the student who does not have internet connection. The network is important. If you're going to do e-learning, you're going to have network, not only within your university, which I'm quite sure all universities, uh, within your campus, everything is fine. You might have good internet connection. But now for the child that has gone back home, who doesn't have a connection. Now, how do you connect to that child, all right? Or if the child has the connection, has the tools, but there are still other problems that the child might feel, 
because some of the students, or I think most of the students, if they have not been going through e-learning, yeah, they will face problems with self-directed learning. They don't know time management. They don't know how to access the right resources. And they don't know what are the expectations of the lecturers anymore. So there's a disconnect between the lecturer and the student now, all right? And at the same time, most important, is the lecturer himself, all right? So the, for the lecturer, remote teaching, uh, not only teaching, remote assessment methods, yeah, prior knowledge. How much knowledge did most of the lecturers have prior to the lockdown to be able to immediately move on to remote teaching? Yeah. So this situation was not an ideal situation in the beginning, but this situation is an emergency situation. You have no choice. This was a situation of no choice. Yeah? So you have to get onto the bandwagon, all right? And um, this is from this paper. I saw this um, paragraph from this paper, all right, where the author is um, reporting 1.5 billion learners around the globe for schools and universities affected. Think of that number, yeah? 1.5 billion learners we are talking about. Right, And this number of students affected were about 90% of the world's enrolled students. Okay, So these are, this whole thing made the learning inequalities widen. We had a motto, learning never stops. So we wanted learning to continue, all right? But how do you sustain the education system in a remote manner if the people are not ready? The infrastructure is not ready. So this was fueled by the digital divide. Yeah. So this is what we are working with now. All right. And um, what happened at my university, I can share with you what happened at my university. Yeah, just because I think this session can be more of a experience learning session because uh, if I don't want to go into how to, because we have a lot of uh, literature on that. Yeah. But uh, what we did at University of Malaya, I can start with uh, the early times. Yeah? We started as early as January, February, 2020, when if you look at the side, um, the world was already, if you look here, mostly it is happening in China. Yeah? So recommendations for cases were being um, revealed. So what we started to do was the first person who took up accountability, of course, was the Ministry of Education and the university's management, all right? So the earlier onset, a little bit of encouragement there was by this tool. And what we did was announcements. Announcements which were at that point only telling people to be careful. Be careful. These are the symptoms, this is what you can do. We prepared infographics, yeah? We prepared a process flow on SOPs, on what to do in campus. So there was no emergency at that time yet. During this period until February, we were not in an emergency uh, situation. And, uh, but we did, and our semester had started actually. We were about four weeks into the semester when we said, all right, uh, lecturers can begin with uh, non-face-to-face. -face. We have an online learning system. So we said, okay, you can teach um, from home. That was the first week, all right? Now, what happened after that was we had a national lockdown on 18th of March. Okay, so when national lockdown happened, so um, people were told to be staying home. So at that point, Nobody knew what to do. Students have gone home, lecturers are home, and we are, said, we are told that, okay, you're working from home, but there are gonna be no classes, okay? So the ministry announced uh, that all classes will stop, okay? So our semester, in the mid of the semester, we only could do about five weeks of teaching and learning. And um, after that, we had a break here. We had a long break for the students and we told them, okay, 27th of April, we will resume. Okay, now to tell the lecturers, we will resume with fully remote teaching learning, all right? You work from home and uh, you all, so many of the entry-level examinations were cancelled. Now, were the lecturers 
ready to teach from home? Were the lecturers ready to go fully remote teaching learning? Okay, so how to jumpstart that? Yeah? So these are the challenges we faced at that time. Students keep asking, when are we going to begin? Because especially final year students who want to complete their uh, semesters and lecturers are, how are we going to do this? We are so used to conventional method. I'm so used to being in class and I'm so used to facing my students, all right? I have 100 students in my class. What am I going to do online with them? Okay, if I have, uh, if I'm teaching for two hours in class, now do you expect me to be at home on my computer for two hours talking to the students? And uh, I think most of us who have experienced it, it's a bit difficult because you can't see each and every student's face. You don't know what they are doing on the other side of the screen. Yeah, and um, location of students in remote area. Yeah, we had to address that because we had students who had gone home, they were not in campus, yes, and they, they gave us feedback that they do not have internet access at home. Yeah, because if you look earlier figures, uh, internet penetration at Malaysia, in Malaysia is only about 80 something. And I'm sure it, in, with you, it's only about 50 something. So that is, that's a big, huge problem with remote learning, all right? And changes in teaching. So the lecturer who stands in class and you can lecture for two hours, but when you are online, are your students going to sit and listen to you for two hours? So that's a big difference. Definitely the pedagogy is different now. It's a different method. And assessment, are the same assessments that you had planned for them also going to work now? I had a class where the assessment, the students were supposed to go out into public libraries and do a survey on user needs. And during the lockdown, now I'm supposed to continue teaching, but my students can't go to the public library. They are home, it's a lockdown. So now I have to know how can I have a different assessment, but with the same learning outcome. Because what, the, what we were told was, you have a course, you're responsible for this course, and you have already set learning outcomes for the student, that cannot change. The level of learning outcome is the same. The student still has to learn that, what you have planned. But now you need to be very, very creative. How are you going to change your teaching method, your assessment method, all right? And the challenge of course, competency. Because we are a comprehensive university, we did not have the infrastructure or much skills in content development. How you develop online content is not the same as developing PowerPoint slides for your classroom. It's different. Yeah? And students, how do you go online for uh, meeting tools? So if you're, you're going to use Google Meet for your classroom, some students found it difficult. Yeah. Until now, I have students who also find it difficult when you tell them, okay, you're doing a presentation, you need to share, and they have difficulties in sharing, all right? So the e-learning platform that we had been using, Spectrum, that did help us a lot because we had a very strong e-learning platform, which for the past few years, we had been encouraging student uh, lecturers to use, but still it had not reached 100%, okay? And of course, then there were demands of administrative IT staff. Yeah? Everyone had to uh, handle these challenges. Okay, now who helped in the jumpstart? I'll go back to jumpstart, yeah? because with all these problems being faced, now who helped in making the lecturers go forward? Because after five weeks of not teaching, five weeks of being at home, and you are like, those who were learning on their own were fine, but some were like in a denial. I can't do this. They keep telling us, I can't do this. I am not trained to do this, okay? So the external help was the vice chancellor who had to be very, very committed, yeah? So the vice chancellor immediately told the quality management and enhancement center because we are also in charge of quality assurance of academic program, that the quality of the academic programs cannot decline. Yeah? And the Deputy Vice Chancellor of Academic and International, um, 
our deputy vice chancellor had four main units yeah, for the academic administration, the strategic planner, the enhancement and leadership development center, and the internship training and academic enrichment center. So these five centers had to work together in synergy. All right. So we have to look at two policies. We had changes in policies. And the other external help we got was from our national qualification agency. Okay, the Malaysian Qualification Agency played a very big role to jumpstart this remote teaching learning because they came up with guidelines that we call advisory notes. So as early as March, the first advisory note was out and those notes told us what can be done and what cannot be done, how to go ahead. Because questions such like, okay, um, skills lab, how do we do that? Yeah. Students who were supposed to be out there for internship, what do we do? All right. So in class, I have uh, 14 weeks of lecture, but three weeks I was supposed to do practical classes. What do I do? So all these questions were answered by the National Qualification Agency guidelines. They gave us guidelines, but of course, the, the most important thing was, again, quality must be assured. Learning outcomes cannot be um, degraded downgraded the learning outcomes must be seen so we worked together all right and we came up with many many guidelines so this is the push that we gave to the lecturers all right we told we came up with guidelines on where to start as early as march okay then another one on way forward so every time there were changes in what was happening around us we upgraded those guidelines. And on 2nd of April, we had the online teaching guideline during COVID-19 pandemic, explaining to people what are the methods that you can use to teach, all right? How to do the assessment, how to change your examination components, because now you cannot have a face-to-face -face examination. So what are the alternative assessments that you can do, all right? And this, uh, Portal and we disseminated all this information. ADEC is actually our center for uh, academic staff development. So they do a lot of training, especially teaching learning. Okay, so we had another guideline for industrial training. So we allowed students, if the industry allow you to work from home, so the student can work from home, and that is considered industrial training for the student. Yeah a guideline for final online examination, how to conduct the examination. And we had to go through all the courses and look at courses where the examination component can now be changed to alternative assessments. Yeah? And we had postgraduate um, operating standard, uh, standard operating procedures for use of lab because this we could not avoid. That was later, much later in June, when the movement control uh, was slightly amended and postgraduate students were allowed to come back uh, to the university. Yeah. And not only, I should say, it's not only the university who's going to help to jumpstart, all right? Most important is the ICT support. If you look here, data plan package for you and students by telecommunication companies, learn from home support free data. In fact, even um, there were companies which gave students uh, free laptops. Yeah. So what we had to do immediately was get in touch with telecommunication companies who were willing and we ran a survey. Yeah? This feedback helped us a lot. So this is also another jumpstart another enabler to jumpstart, where the feedback that we got from the students, the usage of their e-learning, do they have internet access? Do they have the tools to access the internet? Because within five weeks, we want to start remote learning. So from their feedback, we could identify students who really needed help. So for those students, we approached the telecommunication companies and they gave data plan packages from them. They gave free data to the students. Uh, some of the faculties even managed to get the hardware for the students to use, all right? And another issue we had was decision on grading system. As we know worldwide, um, many of the examinations were put on hold, yeah? even Cambridge examination, there was a big hoo-ha yeah? about the way it was 
the gradings was being done. So what we did was we asked the students, we are going full online. You will not be having examinations as the usual examination, but alternative assessment. When we are planning to change the grading system, do you want to still stick to the normal grading system? Or for that semester, we have the, uh, an alternative grading system where it's just a pass or a fail. But the feedback from students told us they do not want that. Yeah, because we had to take into account yeah, the uh, accessibility for the students. So they said that they want a normal grading system because they were very afraid of uh, in years to come when they go out to the industry to ask for a job and the industry, the employer will ask, want to look at their transcript with complete grades. So students were concerned about that. So we said, okay, fine. So we told them, yeah, okay, we will use the normal grading system. There's going to be no special grading system. All right, so, and how the lecturers were teaching, we did a massive survey, feedback from the lecturers, how they felt doing it for the semester and also feedback from the students. Yeah. So all these are enablers. These were the external push that we got to help people move on to adopting the remote teaching learning. All right, uh, this, subject, this is just uh, what was the contents of the uh, online teaching learning guideline that we prepared during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, this guideline was with the intention of being used for the previous semester. Uh, our semester was supposed to run from uh, February to June, but then it got postponed. So we only finished at uh, early August. All right, so in here, we gave people guidelines on calculating the student's learning time. Now, how do you calculate? How do you calculate student learning time compared to in class and online? Yeah, because the feedback, some of the feedback, and we are improving on this guideline uh, for the upcoming semester, which will start in October. Because the feedback we got from student, one of the main feedback was um, too much. They said lecturers became uh, a bit too, <laughs> probably a bit too active because they were not sure. There was a time of they are not sure what they are doing. So the number of assessments increased. So instead of, for example, teaching, say I have a three hour class. So instead of the three hour uh, lecture class and having activities in class, the lecturers probably would have a one hour online face to face lecture. And then the rest of it was activities activities for students to be done. But what happened was some of them, because there's no training, proper training in pedagogy, the online activities were given a very short period of time. All right, so within the next hour, you hand in this. So the students are not happy with that because when you are doing activities like that, solo at home, without resources, without being able to go to the library and limited online resources, it takes longer. So now we realize that in the training, lecturers needed training on even not only teaching, but also assessment, how to create assessments and how to set a time for that assessment. All right. We had lecturers calling in and say, okay, I want to do a take-home exam. How long should I give the student? So some lecturers were doing take-home exam, six hours. Some were doing take-home exam, 24 hours. Some were doing take-home exam, three days. Right? Because there was uncertainties. How do I do this? Of course, it all depends again on the content of the exam. So these were some of the things that we tried to help them with the guideline. All right, and we also gave guidelines on how to deter cheating, yeah? how to do moderation of exam questions. Of course, here now it was quiz questions or uh, alternative assessment. We still had to do moderation. So how do you email files to each other? Because exam, any matters of exam are of top priority and you know that uh, usually at the faculty level uh, within your department, everything is top secret and kept very carefully in the world. But now you are exchanging exam questions online. So how to encrypt? So even to that level, there were guidelines being given to the, to the lecturers. Yeah. Okay. And um, 
while all that is going, preparation for the semester to begin again, we had many, many series of training. Yeah? We did online training. Uh, our training center, ADEC, was uh, very, very committed. They had a lot of online teaching. Lecturers were asked and they had to report to their head of departments on the number of training sessions that they have um, participated in online. All right. So it was a bit tiring. I myself, I must say that it was a bit overwhelming. Yeah, because every day you, you are home, you're not at work, you are home and uh, you, there are online uh, trainings that are going on. So you have to sit and go through it. And at the same time, you become very apprehensive. You are not used to this. There are, these are new things that you need to learn. All right. And how much can a one hour or two hour online session hold your interest? And then you have to do it on your own. So there's a lot of trial and error. Yeah. But what we did do was we have a website where all these training materials are put up on that website. Okay. So the videos that are being used, all the uh, materials, guidelines that were being uh, developed, all the webinar series. Yeah. So the webinar series, we have the links. All the links are being shared, any PowerPoint, any YouTube, all is being shared and um, the lecturers can view at any time. All right. So the purpose for this also was designed such, so to give the lecturers an idea, this is the same thing you can do with your students. Yeah. So when you're dealing with students, if you use Google Meet, just don't go online for that hour, please record it, all right, and then share it with your students, okay? Or Use YouTube and create your online lecture, upload it for the students so they can watch it again and again and they learn, all right? Okay. So, yeah, all right. Now, disruptive, yes. Emergency, yes. It's a pandemic, yes. But something good came out of it, all right? When we reviewed, and we saw that our learning management system, we call it Spectrum, yeah? it's a Moodle-based system. For years, we had that system and we were trying very hard to get all lecturers to use it. And we were trying very hard for lecturers, not just upload your slides or your materials for the lecture, but there are many functions in the system. Please use all those functions. Please go into blended learning with your students. And what happened is, within after semester two, and we see the jump, all right? 335% increase of use. Almost all lecture and platform. In fact, I will say all the lectures because they had no choice. So this is what we learned. In cases of emergency, all right? When you push, people will take that leap because there is no choice. You will take that leap, all right? And our students, overseas students who had gone back to their home because of uh, the pandemic, they were accessing, we could reach out to them and continue teaching even within Malaysia, the numbers were there. We were happy with the outcome, all right? Okay, and uh, we saw that what they were using from the feedback that we got, uh, there were a lot of online lectures being conducted uh, lecturers were still very keen to put their face up for the students because students say we want to have a look at the lecturer. Okay, uh, some lecturer used recorded lectures and let the students wa uh, watch first on YouTube and then maybe have an online session to, for discussion or voiceover PowerPoint. Uh, some were pushing towards creating MOOC content, all right, simulation software for skill session, webinars. Uh, communication via social media tools. These are some of the feedback that in the first semester, in the first trial, lecturers were using, all right? And redesigning of modules. Now, this was something which was very, very necessary. As I said before, you cannot have the same teaching method online. It's different. And some people were trained and some were not. In fact, majority were not. Okay, so it was a daunting task because you're inexperienced. You do not know, for example, 
uh, someone might not have ever developed their teaching content using YouTube. Okay, but now they wish to do so. So it's time consuming compared to just walking into your class and giving a lecture. All right, and the suitability of the content. All right, so in a lecture, you speak more, your PowerPoint slide might have less information, but now the student is going to look at self study. So the content must be interesting. You can't have slides with so many words on it because at home they get distracted. All right, and student centered learning, how are you going to design assessments or activities for class where the student is self centered learning, they have to learn on their own. All right. And uh, another issue we were having was an attendance. Because for our undergraduate students, we were very particular about attending classes. So when it was online, the lecturers were like, how do you want me to do this? All right. So we said, look, attendance is basically because you want the child to learn. So in an online, we now we use the term participation. So you look for participation. So you look for activities that you are doing with them while you are online and see who is participating. Yeah. So online exams, online assignment, these were all challenges that they feel they had to go through. Yeah. Okay. So my towards the end, I'm coming towards the end actually. Yeah. Uh, when I use the word jumpstart, the question we have to ask ourselves is when you jumpstart your car. Mainly, usually, if once the battery is dead, right? Okay, you jump start it. How long will the car function? And what do you do after you've jump started? So, most of the time, if the battery is dead, you jump start it, you go to the workshop and you change your battery and you start it again, right? You move on, right? So, that's the same thing. So, initially, for the previous semester, we, a lot of people came together, the ministry, the um, Malaysian Qualification Center, the university management, HODs, the center for training, uh, my center for quality assurance, telling them how you must make sure their learning outcomes are assured. So a lot of documentation, a lot of things had to be documented. We made sure that they documented the changes that they were making, all right? So, but after that, now we, for University Malaya, uh, October is our second semester will begin for the, the, sorry, new session is beginning. And the government has ordered that uh, online classes will carry on till end of the year. So it's going to be remote again. So now we tell them that, listen, you have to be responsible. All right, you have been given the push. This is the way you're going, all right? You can consider yourself still in an emergency state or you can consider it as this is the norm. Now you have to be responsible for your continuous development. Okay, if earlier the university between the month of March to June, we had so many training sessions, online training sessions. Right now, yes, we have taken one step back. It has decreased because we expect now each individual lecturer, you have to improve on your own. You have to go ahead. You have to look at curriculum resources. You have to look at lessons, look for videos. You have ample time now to look for resources, yeah? to plan for the upcoming semester. All right. In fact, there are a lot of supporting resources online that you can find, which will help you to get resources, to get uh, lessons, ready-made lessons. Of course, now here, you have to educate them, you have to educate the lecturers that you cannot pick a video from the internet, download a YouTube video, upload it on your website and let your students watch that. Okay, the, that video cannot replace your lecture, but that video is a resource for your lecture. So you are using it to make a, a point. You're using it as additional to add value to your lecture. Okay, so this was one of the, um, I should say, challenge that we faced in quality assuring the programs. Yeah, to keep on telling people, of course, you have to give a bit of leeway in the beginning because everyone is on a learning curve. All right, but for us in this coming semester, like for my department, we'll be looking at how 
what are the resources being used and how these resources are being used. Okay, so effectively, there's a lot of lessons. It's just like when you have so many books in the library on your subject area, you don't just give the book to your student, you extract information from there and that's what you share with the student. So the same thing, there are a lot of online resources and you take that resources and you extract what is important and share with the students, but the learning material has to be done by the lecturer themselves. Okay. So at our department, in my department of library information science, um, what we did was uh, we discussed at program level. We run a two masters program. Okay, so we, because it's a small department, but still it is very important. How do we make sure that our students are still learning the same? Yeah, the student who is going to graduate from this remote and our earlier students, they have the same knowledge and skills. So we revised our teaching learning methods in a group. We revised our examination. We came up with alternative assessments on uh, for those learning outcomes, all right? We use the online platform to teach, all right? How do we use our spectrum, our learning management system? How do we use social media to keep in touch with our students? We were creating, uh, here in Malaysia, WhatsApp is quite um, popularly used, all right? And how to encourage students to self-learn and sharing resources with them. We have to go an extra mile. We sat down and discussed because students are very dependent on resources, okay? And we have to provide them with those resources and we had to have intervention with students, all right? We have to address students who could not finish their continuous assessment or their assignments in time. So if in the conventional way, we were giving students, say you have an assessment and uh, you have to pass up within two weeks. So now we we sit and we dusk and discuss and we say, do this, does the student have the resources to do that? Okay, so maybe instead of two weeks, we'll give this child four weeks or three weeks, all right? And if it's an online quiz, last time, if you have an online quiz, okay, if it is a quiz for 15 minutes, you have this many questions, 15 minutes, it's an online quiz. But now we are going to rethink that. Does the child have the resources or the mindset? Okay, the mindset is very important to see, to still recognize that the students are also going through a pandemic. The students are also facing a lot of issues at home with family members. Yeah? So that compassion must come into the remote teaching in this emergency case, all right? And that compassion must be reflected in the teaching learning methods, reflected in the assessment methods. So we discussed that to help out our students. And like I said before, our students, some of them, we have a lot of international students who had gone back to their country. And at their country, when they go back, they do not have the resources. For example, online databases, yeah, to get journal articles and to get materials from the online library or eBooks. Whereas here we have in UM. So we as lecturers, we have to share additional material with them. Yeah, where in the conventional way, we would have said, okay, go and search. But here they search and when they search and they do not have the full text, we tell them, look, you listen, you can ask from us. We will provide to you. If we have access, we will provide to you, but you do the search and tell me what you want. So these are certain changes that we had to make, all right, to help out the students in the department. So we, overall, yeah, uh, this is my personal view, all right? This pandemic has, is a disruption to education, yes, okay? But within this disruption, because we don't know how long this disruption is going to be, we need to continue the education. But in continuing the education, we must not forget we are continuing it in because of a pandemic. So there has to be compassion. Compassion to the students and compassion to its staff because staff are also going through the same thing, all right? But the staff has to be responsible for the student in where education is concerned, yeah? 
Right. So lastly, I would like to share this, yeah, because I do face many uh, lecturers in UM. There are three thousand over lecturers, and in my department, we deal with about two hundred over uh, programs, and uh, we are responsible for the quality control of these programs. And we come across many people who do not want to change, who feel that what they have been doing all these years is the right way, all right? This is the method, and this has produced fantastic students. Yes. If you are using this method from 20 years ago, you must also realize that 20 years ago, that student who was in your classroom was also 20 years ago the mindset of a student 20 years ago. But today when you are in the classroom, today you have a student whose mindset is of today. And the students, even though they we always say that technologically they are way ahead of us from lecturers. Yeah, they know how to, all the know-hows of technology. But we came to realize that when it comes to learning, when it comes to learning, they are still students. We know better than them, but we have to teach according to their level of what, how their method of learning is. All right. So we have to change in our methods. And um, I would like to see this as, I will not say opportunity because the, the pandemic itself is something which is nothing to glorify. It is sad. It is extremely sad from all of us, yeah. but for those of us who have gone into this push, who have been pushed forward to improve and go towards remote teaching and learning, we hope you can continue to do so because it's already a way forward. All right. So with that, uh, I would like to end my session. All right. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, uh, thank you, Madam, for your nice presentation and a very large, uh, enlightening our participant, Madam. Uh, from uh, I received some uh, questions uh, from the participant. Okay, question is very general type already. I read, but I am putting you. I uh, I will take up only few questions. Uh, you mentioned that after that you have some program. So one participant, madam, he is asking, you know, in the, this e-learning scenario, still I, we are learner. Uh, means as a teacher, we are learner. So how we can evaluate the students? Uh, many times it have their performance in these situations. Even we are not very much confident. Yes. Okay. I totally agree. Yes. We as lecturers, um, we have for the past few months, I'm sure all of us, including me, yeah, um, have faced this problem because you are also struggling to learn. But just keep telling yourself, because I will share with you, uh, when I had to start back uh, on the uh, 26th of April, and I had my first online session with my students, all right, and I decided to use Google Meet. So before that, I have to ask my daughter, my daughter who is 19. So I asked her, I said, how do I do this? So I learned from my daughter because they are the best ones. They know what to do. I had been going online um, sessions who were teaching me what to do, but it is still different when you learn, you listen online and you're actually having to do it. Okay. So, so I was also a bit apprehensive. Okay. I learned from my daughter and on the first class, I will tell you, I was nervous. Okay. How am I going to do it? When I share my slides, are my students going to see my slide? But I realized as I went into the class and I'm dealing with my students, they were more nervous than me. You know, so many of them had problems. They said, oh, they can't see, they can't hear, they had noises. I have to tell them, okay, if I am speaking, you have to mute your microphone. Yeah. So however it is, at the end of the day, tell yourself you are the teacher. So have that confidence. You are the teacher. You 
will do better than the students. All right, it's just in terms of knowledge. When we walk into the class and we are teaching our class, we know that somehow the student's knowledge base is less than ours. That's why we are the teacher and we are going to share with them. So online also, we are also still learning, but never show your student that you are still learning. Always be confident with your student, all right? But like I said in the last few slides, you have to pick it up. You have to pick it up because there is no choice right now. So train yourself, ask for help and pick up on how to do this assessment. And I'm not sure about your university, yeah, but at our university, we the training center for academic development, uh, they, are, they are playing a very big role. They're really playing a very big role. They have online training uh, continuously, yeah. I hope that helps. Madam, in our university, actually, we have a different uh, training program time to time. We organized already. But this question came from participant who is not from our university. Actually, this webinar is not concerned to only our university. All over the country, uh, more than 285 uh, participants, they are now on their live, different part of the India. Madam, uh, second okay. question, no, yes. one participant, he just want to know, uh, no, there is a, any website or any online uh, uh, website through that we can learn the uh, online teaching learning skills. Oh, okay. Um, there are many, actually, um, I can actually share with you some of the materials that we use at uh, University Malaya. Okay. So, uh, uh, Dr. Manoj, will you be able to, be, you will be in contact with these participants later also? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. I can share with you some of the content. Okay. All right. Um, online, actually, um, what we use mainly are from uh, YouTube. There, if you go to the educational site of YouTube, in that educational site of YouTube, you, can, you will find many videos of instructional learning. Yeah, instructional methods where people uh, talk about uh, the various methods of learning. Okay, but I can share some of them with you. Yes. And, um, uh, some participants, they actually, they belong to the different part of the country and um, uh, they, especially they belong to the rural area of the country and they are I see. Okay. About, uh, internet problem, connectivity mm -hmm. and all. So yes. uh, they are just asking things such situations, how we can come up. So if you enlighten something, as you... Mm -hmm. Okay, you see, the yeah, I understand that uh, it, the situation is a little different in Malaysia compared to India. Yeah, because here we did not find, uh, we did not face a very big problem in terms of infrastructure. So the infrastructure was okay. Uh, internet connection was okay, even for students, though a small percentage, like for UM, I think roughly about 2% of students did say that they do not have um, the connection. And for those students, um, they used the postal service for sending in their assignments. Some of them used that. And some lecturers say some of these students, they used the data on their handphone once we got the telecommunication companies to give them data. All right, as for um, methods that can be used for assessment, it is, for example, yeah, if it is online, yeah, you are having a session online with your students, uh, give them time. You can have the same questions that you would ask in class, but you can use, say, Google Form. All right, so if you possible, if this is only if you have the connection, uh, you can use Google Form and put up questions for them and give them slightly longer time to come back with the feedback. All right. And remind them that they are not supposed to copy. You know, that is another issue of cheating and plagiarism, which comes with this. Uh, so for the first semester, we just educated the students and told the lecturers. Uh, but like I said just now, yeah, the word compassion, um, you cannot totally prepared. assignments to the internet. Everything is now going to be an open book. But we look at the content 
And we also have a software called Turnitin. So we use that Turnitin. Students have to submit to Turnitin and then only submit to the lecturer. So that's how we control that. But if you have no connection, then I'm not sure how I cannot answer that. Yeah, because that is a serious problem. If you don't have the internet connection and getting in touch with your students, if it is in a situation of uh, emergency lockdown, then yes, learning is not going to happen. Yeah, Madam, mm -hmm. uh, one uh, teacher, he's asking, no, how to engage the student in online mode of teaching? How to engage, okay. Because many times oh, I have, uh, on the mobile and uh, they are not very serious, so... Yes. Yeah, it's so much more difficult. <laughs> I understand. It's so much more difficult. In fact, I think even with staff, uh, when you have online meeting, uh, I'm sure the staff is doing a few things. Yeah. Uh, sometimes even I am on an online meeting, I can do two meetings at a time. Yeah. You can be present more than one place. Okay. For the students, yes. Um, in a classroom, you can look at everyone right up if your classroom is big and right to the end, the 200 students also, you sort of see them. Okay. Online, what I usually do is off and on, I call out a name. All right. So as you are lecturing, you have a question, you just call out a name and you see whether the student answers or not. How long does the student take to answer? So you know whether the student screen is just on and they're not around. Okay. And the other thing I do is if my class is small, I don't allow them to off their camera. They off their microphone, but the camera has to be on. So I need to see them. So off and on, I look at them, all right? And uh, I'll share with you one of the faculties during examination. Uh, so this was a program which wanted to do an uh, online, I'm um, sorry, a written examination. Okay, so what they did was they broke up the students into different groups. They used Microsoft Teams and they broke the students into different rooms and each room a lecturer would supervise. So you're actually watching the students online while they are doing the exam in their home or in their own room. So you tell them to show you using their phone, the, the room around them, all right? And you watch them doing the examination. It is not 100% proof, uh, cheating proof, yeah, but uh, it is still effective. Yeah, the student is, can be a bit more careful because they know someone is watching. Yeah. Yeah, Madam, uh, it, uh, it would be the last question. Yes. Uh, how we can conduct the practical exam through online mode? Okay, practical is uh, exam. What we have done, uh, online mode is difficult. So what our university did was for practical exam, uh, we asked the students to come in in batches of 20. This was also a directory from the um, ministry. Maximum 20 in a lab, and they were allowed to come with all the SOP and they conduct the exam. So we, need, we used many rooms, many more rooms, and we broke them up into smaller groups. But um, I have got feedback from some of the faculties in sciences and engineering. They use uh, simulation software to conduct the exam. I, I can't give you the exact detail of the courses, but uh, that's the feedback that I got, that some of them use uh, simulation software for practical skills. Okay, madam. Yes. With this, madam, uh, now we, I came to end of the sessions. So now on, uh, on behalf of the, our in department of library information science, Mizoram University, as well as in, uh, in our university, Mizoram University, I would like to thank a lot for giving your time, sharing your experience. And uh, definitely it is very useful in Madam and now chat box a lot of message from different participants they are putting about your lecture they are appreciating many tools and techniques they are able to uh, know how in this pandemic time they can continue their teaching and learning things so uh, with this madam thank you so much uh, for joining us and hope now uh, there will be a permanent collaboration between uh, our two university and uh, time to time i request you to help and support our department in the teaching and learning process thank you so much madam and uh, all the participants uh, i would like to request you 
kindly fill up your feedback form already it is shared in the chat box and uh, time is till today 5 pm before that you have to fill up that form and uh, everyone within one week no need to send any email anything within one week you will get your certificate thank you so much thank you so much madam with yes yeah. thank you everyone and thank you dr manoj it was uh, a good session and uh, i i'm very happy to see the comments also yeah. all right so till we meet again and uh, have a happy and safe uh, weekend thank, thank you thank you